Ladies and gents, welcome back to Decently Indecent episode 21. Glad to have you here for another little chat. Um, this week, I'm going to be I'm gonna be dipping my toes in um, a topic that's a little more esoteric or um, per, I guess what we would call uh, philosophical in a sense, not not too crazy, not too out there, um, but just the the idea of you know purpose uh, of any individual life, you know, from you listening to me, what what gets us up in the morning, what motivates us to do hard things, what motivates us to to put effort into things and in our relationships and our jobs and. Uh, and the different areas of our life that that mean things to us. It's something, I mean, this is probably just a side effect, you know, of <laughs> going, uh, teetering on the edge of my late 30s, heading into 40. These are things you think about a little more. But from the day we're born, you know what I mean? Everyone has a particular purpose, and then that transforms throughout the course of your life, you know, from uh, a toddler that doesn't know what's going on, trying to learn how to walk up into, uh, you know, somebody... Uh, that's at the end of their life who might have changed their purpose to one that is more centered on spending time with people versus trying to acquire material things as their perspective on life has changed as they've aged. It's something we think about all the time. Every day we're thinking about it. And usually our actions are a direct result of some sort of internal compass and North Star that guides us. This is obviously a topic that will cross over with religion oftentimes, um, because for many people, some sort of religious backbone in their life uh, or theological belief of some sort and some deity or whatever it is, is their North Star and what guides them and gives them purpose for a lot of ways. Many of you know that have watched me or listened to some of my stuff over the years that I came from a, a background just like that in a, in a household that was very religious. And I know some people have had experiences that weren't so great in that particular background and mine was wonderful. I'm not very religious in the traditional sense anymore. I know I do still think a lot about it because for me personally, and I want to say this too, just going into this as I'm just kind of, I'm just talking openly and candidly. I have a, a handful of things written down to kind of prompt, but most of this is just going to be um, just a little insight into my life and what I think about it because, you know, maybe that could... You know, there's, I assume there's people out there listening that maybe are in the same boat I am. I know there's going to be many of you who are very set in your ways or maybe much more rigid in your beliefs and have a belief system in place that feels to you as rock solid and as close to some sort of objective truth as there can be. And all I would ask is that you not, well, I, I don't care. People are going to feel the way they're going to feel, but just know that anything I'm saying today is not in any way meant to kind of demean or try and make light of something that you believe to be your foundational truth. It's just a side effect of my, I would say, desire to find some sort of objective truth and and figure out, you know, what this whole thing is about. And it, interestingly, you know, as I've as I've gotten a little bit older and through my college years and twenties and in my thirties, as I've fallen out of the trappings of the religious lifestyle and my spiritual relationships have changed a bit and I've become a bit more secularized and I have, I would say a, a more agnostic view on life, which I've spoken about before, you know, where you derive your purpose and like the reason you do things changes a little bit because I grew up in a household where everything was for the glory of God. In a way it can be a wonderful thing because it's, I think that's maybe a beautiful side effect. I don't want to say side effect. It's maybe a beautiful part of religion and why I guess <laughs> just religion in general is one of the foundational aspects of humanity is humans vying for the meaning of life and essentially trying to secure some sort of life after our mortal life on earth. And then there's the other side of that, which is people that are like, oh, I just think we're just specks of atoms and dust floating through a big expanse. And when we die, we turn to dust and that's it. There's all types of theories about the soul and the physical body versus the soul. Does your soul survive after the physical body? All these things. 
And I'm not going to go too deep into that, but I just wanted to just touch on the religious piece of it first, because I think a lot of, for a lot of people, that is where much of their purpose is derived from. And then there's kind of like the middle of that, where it's the people who are religious, quote unquote, right? They go to church, they do the thing. <laughs> they, uh, they're putting the, they're putting, they're trying to put the, the, the square peg into the square hole when they can, uh, to do the right thing, to, to try and secure their spot in heaven or, you know, just cause that's how they were raised. And that's what they were led to believe is, is the right thing to do. And then kind of under that veil, it's mostly just the normal grind that most of us face, which is like, how do we live a life we can be proud of? How can we be successful? Hopefully maybe we can start a family, um, Whatever it is, it's it's different for everybody. But I think for for many people, it boils down to a lot of the same things that are just like underlying innate human needs, which is like the need for connection, survival, which kind of is part of the umbrella, like finances and materialistic success kind of fall under that to a degree where you're trying to survive in our present day society. You need to find a way to support yourself in a... In, and uh, a family, whatever that is. I've gone through several iterations of, I think, what what drives me over the years. I've always, I think, been, I've kind of had this general gut feeling of just n being okay with not knowing. And I think that's the antithesis of one of the core <laughs> reasons people are religious is because it it gives you this comfort Right, if you have faith in this particular thing, this God that's created the earth and humans and wants the best for us, et cetera, et cetera, it gives you this comfort in the unknown. Right, it gives you the it gives you comfort in the one area that is, I think, very difficult for humans to grasp. Is it's like it's it's uneasy to be like, I I don't know what happens after you die. I don't know why we're here. Right, are we really just like some crazy accident? Like, are we? Did there, was there a big bang? Did we, did we just kind of grow from a single celled organism over hundreds of billions of years? That's so <laughs> it's, it's, you know what I mean? Like, so if you're, if you're on that side of the aisle where you're just trying to strictly be like this kind of the scientist atheist type of things, it's just very, it's depressing in a sense, but I guess it's more pragmatic. And then there's the other side of it, which is very faith driven and like purpose filled, which is, well, well, we're here because. God created us and, you know, all the things that trickle down from, from that theology. So, you know, from someone who, who came from that and I guess, you know, so much of, I think what we believe as adults or just as humans in general is very environmental. Obviously, if you grow up in a, in a household that is teaching these things and you're around it all the time, you're obviously going to fall, I would say into that, at least for a particular period of time until maybe you go out and have other experiences that might inform you in other ways. And I think that's good. I, th I think, you know, for me, I've always wrestled in, in my later adult years with, you know, it, the, the agnosticism, this idea that like, it is just some sort of evolutionary thing. And we just exist because we exist and there's not really, it, there's nothing more than dirt and stars and sand. Like I'm always so constantly in awe of the intricacies and the unbelievable nature of just existence in general. And I know for a lot of people that are, that are, that are faith-based and believers, like that is one of the reasons why they do believe in some sort of creator is because it's hard for them to, to fathom the absolute un, the unbelievable and incredible nature just of our existence. It's difficult to fathom, to wrap your mind around. Right. Humans are funny because we're, we're so good at just singling, just having laser focus on single little problems at hand, like your day-to-day -day tasks, little problems in your life that aren't going to matter a couple of weeks from now. Obviously there's bigger problems that might need addressing. And there's obviously traumas that last a lifetime, perhaps there's all these things, but the more, the more you zoom out the layers the more and more insignificant every little problem becomes and the more insignificant you feel, right? And so there is a little bit of melancholy in loneliness almost as I think the far, kind of the farther away you get from this idea that we're all here for a reason and we have a purpose and we're supposed to serve this higher power. And so you have to find 
different reasons in different ways to, you know, not, not to motivate yourself, but you know, different things to give your life meaning. Cause if it's like, well, what if, if at all, at the end of the day, if it doesn't really mean anything, then why should I, why should I be good? Why should I do this thing? Why should I be kind and, and loving? And I don't know, all these qualities that I guess you would, you people would generally consider good. And I think for me, like I'm in a, an interesting position because so many of my character traits, so many of the kind of the foundational morals that I've built my life on come from the umbrella of a religious upbringing. And so I'm so grateful for, I, th I think that's one of the, you know, aside from the realities of the teachings of Christianity or Catholicism or whatever, and whether you believe those or not, I think there can be wonderful side effects that just give you incredible character uh, that can help you build a strong character. So and I, I think about this sometimes because I, when I'm perusing online, whether I'm on Twitter or something, I'm in a weird place in my algorithm where it's like half of the shit I get is crypto stuff. And then there's like 30% like human optimization, like here's 40 things I would have told myself, you know, I'm turning 40. Here's 40 things I would have told myself at 25. And it's like, uh, all this like how to be a better person type of shit pops up in my feed. And, and a lot of times when I see threads from people that I really resonate with, very often I'll like click on their profile and it'll be like, God first, like Christ is King, all these like just a, a lot of these, I guess, particular tenants that people live their life by uh, that I that I typically resonate with are from people that have some sort of faith and are very, you know, vocal about it. And then there's me, which is, it's, I'm in kind of in a weird spot because I, I share a lot of the, I mean, the same feelings, but I'm doing it for a different reason. And I'm not sure what it is all the time. I think it's, I'm not doing it for the glory of God necessarily, because I don't know how much I personally believe that piece of it, but I'm doing it because it just feels like the right thing to do. It feels like a good thing to do, to, to be kind to people, to be gentle when you need to be, to try and maintain a certain level of humility, to to be generous if you can be, you know, a, a lot of the things that I would consider character traits that would make somebody, someone I would want to be friends with. I try to embody those myself. So I think as I've gotten older, I think regardless of what your purpose is, you know, I think for so many people, I know a lot of, a lot of people listening, it's, it's always boiling down to like vocation as you become an adult, once you get through school and you're through those kind of formative years, and you you get to this point in life, inevitably, where I guess one might say you become an adult, quote unquote, where it's like, okay, you, you got to be a little more responsible now. Maybe your parents have cut you off. Maybe you never had parents that had enough money to support you. Whatever your situation is, you got to figure out how to live life. You got to figure out how to support yourself. And that's it. And there's no rule book. There's no guidebook. It's just like, you know, we've all been sold this dream for ever since we were kids, most people my age said, oh yeah, you go to school, you get good grades and you go to a good college and you go $250,000 in debt and then you join the workforce and get a good job and make a good living and get a good house. Like, I think we've all kind of seen the veil pulled back on that a little bit. I'm not saying there's no value in a good education and trying to climb some particular corporate ladder, if that's your prerogative and that feels like what you want to do, but how many times have we seen the person that does that, that goes through those motions, that does what they're told, that gets those grades, that busts their ass, and they go into this vocation that they're not even passionate about? Maybe they're trying to impress their parents, or they're trying to, you know, maybe they were pressured by their parents. You know, I know certain there's certain cultures where you're like excommunicated from your family if you don't, <laughs> you know, become like a doctor or a lawyer or a dentist. You know what I mean? Because like that's that's their value. That is their purpose in life is to be a successful X, Y, or Z. And I just think that's such a backwards way to live life. I think that it's important. I think there needs to be value and you need to put importance on being valuable in some way, whether it's to your family or to a loved one and to the very least to yourself. And I think there's, you know, economically, it's important to it's obviously important to make that a priority, especially as a man. I think there's a lot of different, there's a lot of differences between the genders in many ways. And I know, you know, maybe not as much as there used to be, but I just think it's silly to pretend like those differences don't exist. But for a lot of men, a lot of young men, you know, and you guys listening that are a little younger, and I know some of you guys that, that watch me and listen to me are even older than I am. I mean, there's, there's, there's a, a burden of responsibility that comes with being a man. 
especially in a, a society that values relationships and a high value men that can provide or, you know, take care of the family and add something to society in some way or the other. And there's just a lot of silent pressure that goes along with that, that, that men, I think generally just carry on their back and don't typically talk about. It's not talked too much about in culture. And I think that we saw that in the last couple of years, I think there's been a huge vacuum of role models for young men coming up at a new digital age that feel almost like left behind and slighted a little bit. Like, you know, anything you've seen online, a lot of the stuff we see online has been like, just oftentimes like how awful men are, misogyny, pigs, the Me Too movement. It's like everything we see on the internet is like a man being evil or of some sort, you know? And of course, unfortunately, that's just part of human nature. There's going to be, there's going to be evil people and there's going to be people that do pretty, pretty terrible things. But I think there's a large group of underrepresented men that are men that, that genuinely want to live a fulfilling life and want to do well by themselves and by their family and they want to have a relationship and they want families and kids and all these things. And they, and oftentimes I just think there's not a lot of resources out there for them. And I think in a weird way, part of the reason why like the Tate brothers, Andrew Tate and Tristan Tate really blew up as, as hard as they did was because of that vacuum and these men that felt underrepresented and all of a sudden these guys came along and listen, I'm not, you know, I've, I've, I've said, words about Andrew Tate in the past. I certainly, uh, there's many things I could say about him that, uh, I think are put it this way. There's a lot of choices he's made in his life that, that I, I don't like. And I think, um, may, I don't know, I don't know him personally, obviously, but I don't think he's the best role model, uh, nuts to bolts. But I do think the part of his message that he preaches, which is essentially just personal accountability and working hard, doing what it takes to try and, and become a valuable person uh, in our society and in the lives of those around you. Um, I mean, that that's an important message. People need to hear that. And I will, I would say for him specifically, like if we're talking about Andrew Tate, like there was, Early on, like so much of what he did, I think was trolling. And then he really, he really grew like a huge audience and started to tap into that, tap into that young man, that kind of young man that was looking for direction and purpose in life. And uh, I think too much of it though, for Andrew, for the Tate brothers is, I think it gets a little bit too materialistic. And I think part of that is like the social media strategy. And we've all, you know, the memes of like the, the guy with the Lamborghini or like what colors your Bugatti, like all this stuff. And I think that can be a part uh, 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 of, of someone's purpose of a young man's purpose is to like get to a point where financial independence, I think that's a wonderful goal, but I do think there is a point where once that goal is reached, there's a huge diminishing return on any additional income economic success in general. I know this is a hotly debated topic, and it's difficult to talk about because everyone comes from different backgrounds and has different experiences. But I think there is definitely a level of, of economic s success or financial freedom that really can alleviate some, some, some glaring problems, some day-to-day -day problems, and really upgrade your quality of life. And then after that point is reached, there's a small window where maybe a little bit more is fun and cool. And then beyond that, it drops off a cliff as far as it being something that is fulfilling or that gives you purpose, right? And I think just in general, you see there's so many rich and famous YouTubers and rich and famous actors and people that just are depressed or end up killing themselves and all these things. And as somebody who's maybe never tasted material success, it's really hard to understand why to relate to that. You see this online with people like, how could you, how could you be depressed? You have everything anyone could ever want. And you're rich and you're famous and all these things. And it's like, yeah, man. But I think as Jim Carrey once said, he said, I want everyone to be rich and famous just once so they can realize that money and fame are not where happiness come from. And again, it's so it, it's, it's always tough. Like anytime you see this type of shit on like Twitter or something, or like a, a rich and famous person saying like, oh, it sucks to be rich and famous. Like they get eviscerated in the comments because everyone's like, oh, well, yeah, you can uh, how you can say that now, or how, how could you possibly say that? Like, you don't know what it's like to be X, Y, and Z. Everyone has their problems. But I think that all I'm trying to say is like, 
with the Andrew Tate thing, the whole idea of like just these young men looking for people to look up to, there needs to be more to life and to your goal and to your mission than just acquiring material things and making a digital number on a screen go up whether that's your bank account. There's obviously a baseline, like you like you want to be able to take care of yourself, yes. But beyond that, and this is kind of the, I would say like just from, from my own personal experience, that's part of the thing, that's 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 kind of the, the part of the journey I'm at now where, you know, I most of my life in my 20s, I was stretched pretty hard, paycheck to paycheck. I was, I couldn't pay my student loans out of college. I was dodging car payments. It was pretty tough for, the better, the better part of a decade came out of school with some student loans. And, you know, I come from a, a wonderful family that's, you know, they've never, I've never needed for anything in my life. They would give me the shirt off their back, the most wonderful people in the world. But as I said earlier, I come from a family of deeply religious people that their purpose and their North star is glory to God. Right. And, and, and it's, and it's never been the economic material success that has been the important thing, it's it's the relationships and the serving, serving the Almighty Lord, right? For them. So um, so for me, I wanted something a little bit different. I was like, yeah, I want to I do want that. I want I, I want to be successful. I want to do these things. I want to try to do something that I can that I can be proud of. And I've I've, you know, been lucky enough to have some success at that over the last decade and was able to go from a place of not being able to able to, you know, pay for my car to having a little bit of runway and being able to have a nice truck. And I uh, own a home with my wife and my son now, and I'm in a very blessed position. So that's one of those realizations you have, you know, it's, and I, and you're like, okay, now I have these, these, you know, these, my, my basic needs are met. I have the resources to, to, to have a little free time and do some fun things when I want to want to go golfing on a Thursday or something like that. And life has a funny way of like, when you have money problems, those are louder than every other problem. Right. Money problems just trump other problems. I know because I was there for a long time. And when the money problems go away, life has a funny way of filling in the gaps, filling in the void where those problems were left. Like you would there are other problems just take take its place. <laughs> so they're just they're different problems, but they're still problems. And I know, and this is the thing, like some problems are obviously worse than others, but I remember keenly thinking like when I was younger in my twenties, like, man, if I could just get to this point, whether it be this number or like this level of success, I'm like, then how could like, how could you even have any problems? How could even, you know, like nothing could probably, nothing could go wrong because all of these things that are pressing to me right now that I don't know how to solve, I could solve those. Uh, but weirdly, no, nope, it's just life will find new problems for you to, to tackle. And maybe they may, they might be a little more esoteric or philosophical and less, <laughs> less, uh, less first in the month type, but it's just, it's just funny. So for me, my purpose, you know, it, it has, it has transformed throughout the years. I think for so many people it's vocational. And then beyond that, it's obviously as you get older family, if you have kids, I mean, that's the phase of my life in right now. It's very difficult to even fathom what that feels like or looks like until you have a child. And and um, now so much of what I do is in an effort to preserve the freedoms I have right now to be around for him. I want to be a good example for him. And, you know, the, the classic meme of like, oh, I want to give my, you know, I want to give my kid a better life than I had. And it's like, well, I had a pretty good life, to be honest. I don't, t I don't say that, but I do want to, I want to be the best example for him as I can to, to, to make sure he's acclimated and socially adjusted and, and prepared to become an adult and to go through his teenage years and turn into an adult in a world that can be very grimy and difficult uh, and shady and fucked up. But on the other side of that, there, there's a lot of beauty and a lot of wonderful, a lot of wonderful things as well. Just want him to be well enough equipped with the confidence and some 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 moral some moral foundation and some characteristics that will allow him to traverse uh, a difficult world and 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 try to do some cool things and so that's where a lot of my purpose resides and and uh, that's all weaves into the business and obviously supporting the family I think as a man too that has a family you you get a lot of a lot of your identity comes from uh, maybe being the uh, providing for the family um, in some in some way so these are all 
things I'm traversing. I know in my younger twenties, when I was working in the restaurant and being a musician, like I don't need, I think back then the purpose was just like, there was like a decade long period or more where the, the only purpose was how can I make a living doing something I don't hate? And I think for a lot of people that probably resonates. And, you know, after I got called, after I left college and I had that sales job for a year, I realized, wow, I hate this. And that's when I quit that and started working in restaurants and gigging as a musician. That, that was my purpose. That was my singular goal. It's like, how can I make a living not doing something I hate? And as long as I was working in a restaurant, it was fun. I made great relationships. It was awesome. But it was like, the end goal was always to be able to, it, at the time, it was be a musician. And that obviously changed over the years, but but it was like, how can I do something creative or work for myself in a way that allows me to leave the restaurant? Because that was always a means to an end for me. And so then I, I was able to do that and I hit that goal. And then your purpose has to change again because you've hit that goal and now you have to make a new goal post. Well, now I guess I want to keep that going, but now here we are like, you know, six, seven, eight years later, six years since I've been doing this full time. And so much of my identity is wrapped up in being a YouTuber, which is interesting. And I think sometimes about like, if all, if my channels went away tomorrow, like if I just wanted to ghost the internet, like not thinking obviously economically, that wouldn't be great, but just from a, from a, from a, from a identity and a purpose driven standpoint, like what would that look like for me? I'd have to find a, I, I would just, I don't know. I'd have to rethink who I am. Right. Like, oh, so I'm not not the guy that makes videos anymore. And like, but I, I, I only, I only kind of hypothesize that in my head because I always deal with this, you know, medium grade imposter syndrome where like, I'm happy to keep doing this type of thing for as long as I live. I love media. I love making content, you know, economic incentives inside. I think there's just something so wonderful about being able to, to make people laugh or make people in this, the case of this podcast, not, not, not so much comedy, but to make people think hopefully a little bit. And I'll do that as long as people will listen. But I, again, with the imposter syndrome, I, I oftentimes think like, well, I could wake up tomorrow and there might be no one left listening. And that's, that's always a possibility outside of, you know, there's always obviously YouTube bans and Google shit. There's so many different things that can happen that I'd have to kind of traverse a new landscape around how I'm doing things now. And I'd have to realign what my purpose is. And I'm like, so yeah, I think about this a lot. I know, I know you guys probably go through some, uh, go through a lot of these same thoughts. And I, I do also think too, that like, it's very easy to let the days kind of cruise by without ever really asking yourself these questions from time to time. Like what, am, why am I doing this thing that I'm doing? And this happens a lot. Like why, there's, there's certain things that we do all the time that we know we'd be better off with not doing. And yet we do them anyways. And I'm like, why am I doing it? What, what, like, why am I doing this thing that's detrimental to my supposed goals and my supposed purpose, but I continue to do it anyways. And the days go by, the weeks go by, another year goes by. I'm still doing this thing I hate. I'm still in a job I can't stand. I'm still have this habit that I, I, I hate, but I'm not willing to, to give up. It's funny because some people are just okay with their whole life going by and never really just being like, yeah, no, that's just who I am. It's fine. I know these things are bad for me. It is what it is. You know, I was just watching a, a video on YouTube earlier with, it was the new break 50 challenge with Bryson DeChambeau and John Daly. He's Bryson DeChambeau is a YouTube golfer. I watch, he's a major winner. And John Daly, for those of you who don't know, one of the uh, legend golfer, he's won a few majors, but he's like the Ricky Bobby of <laughs> professional golf, just ripping alcoholic crushes Marlboro Reds. Like, and so he was in this video and he's, but he's like just a nice, fun, jovial guy, great guy, fun to watch. And I look at this guy and I'm like, man, this is such a paradox because it's like, this guy is so comfortable with who he is. He's killing himself with booze and, and food. And like, he's just horrifically unhealthy, but he's so comfortable with who he is and does not for a second, probably does not care to change. He just accepted it. He's like, this is what I love. I'm going to do it. And he's like, jokes about being surprised that he's still alive. Doesn't care. Just fucking having a fun time. And that that's so curious because I feel like there is this kind of new secular religion, quote unquote, that is based around like human optimization, self-optimization. 
Think about the Huberman podcast and how big that podcast got over the last couple of years where it's just this guy that is basically doing four-hour podcasts rooted in science about how we can best optimize every aspect of our human experience from circadian rhythm, from viewing the sun in the morning, delaying coffee by an hour, taping your mouth at night, like all of these things. And obviously like working out and exercise, like those are pretty obvious ones. So, you know, this is, I would say for me personally, speaking of religion and how I spoke about that earlier, where there's been a bit of a, a void, I wouldn't say a void in my life, but there's just as far as where I derive my purpose does not come from a place of spirituality or uh, religious incentives. And I think part of the, part of what's filled that void for me is like human optimism. I guess self-optimization and just trying to treat my, I, I don't, I don't know exactly what to call it. I mean, there's the fitness piece to it, obviously, but then there's like the sleep aspect. It's like, how can I, how can I, how can I best optimize my experience on earth from day to day? I think just from a sense, like just kind of like an overall sense of well being aspect, that's the main reason I do it. Like when I'm working out consistently and feeling healthy and getting good sleep, like you just feel better. There's no, it, there's no other way to really say it. It's the mood. It's like an, it's like natural antidepressants almost. And I've gone through phases where everything has been out of whack and I'm, uh, my eating habits are bad. I'm gaining weight, all these things in like clockwork. I go into spirals of depressive phases and no motivation. It's difficult to find joy in things and stuff like that. And when I attack these things that are personal struggles, personal battles, some physical and some mental, like the physical piece, the diet, the exercise, the nutrition, and the mental piece, the, the making sure the type of content I'm consuming is, is thoughtful, making sure I'm not mindlessly scrolling 12 hours a day, keeping it to like two or three. <laughs> and, uh, you know, the physical challenge of whatever that is, some sort of physical challenge, like either working out or doing something like a sport is just such a, there's just such an obvious correlation to my, my overall life experience in these foundational pieces. And I think that that to me is so important. I mean, there's like, yeah, there's the material success. There's I think so many of these young, so many young cats now are just growing up and they see, you know, they're just like, well, there's just uh, I, there was a there was a study recently where there's an unprecedented an unprecedented amount of young people that are simply obsessed with becoming rich and like their singular goal is just to be rich, and I think that's probably a side effect of certainly a side effect of like the information age and our phones and, and social media and whatnot. I don't think there's necessarily anything wrong with wanting to be wealthy, but I do think it is just one small piece of the puzzle, and. Um, I think a lot of people that are really, really struggling with their day-to-day -day experiences and, and, and their, their feelings of well-being could, could really gain a lot from some of these, I think at the very least, like just doing physically challenging things. I've spoken about that before on the main channel, but that has kind of become my purpose is like how to just trying to optimize my life in a way that I can without like pharmacological intervention or whatever it is, how can I, how can I challenge myself daily and do things that optimize the way I'm living that help me get the most enjoyment out of what I'm doing. Allow me, allows me to feel physically better, mentally better, all those things. And that's that's kind of become my purpose for myself. And then beyond that, it's really just like being a good husband and, and father and trying to be a good son and, and trying to be kind and generous when I can. And these aren't always easy things to do, but I think... I don't think there's a person in the world that has gone out of their way to do something nice for someone and didn't feel great about it. You know what I mean? And we're in a, we we're kind of in a weird place too. And I know like this has come up recently with all this Mr. Beast drama where people being kind and generous, it used to be like acts of service used to be something you did because it's the right thing to do. And it, it feels good. It can give you a sense of purpose. And at some point it became something you did for social media attention. <laughs> so there's a new generation of kids growing up in a world where they think, oh, if I'm going to do something nice for somebody or I'm going to, 
you know, give someone something, I have to record it obviously, because then I can get attention online. Like, and it seems to, it seems like it's really bastardized the entire idea of what it means to be generous and kind anyways. So I would challenge, like I would challenge, and I, I know there's probably, there's probably most of you guys listening to this are a little bit older, so you can kind of understand what I'm saying. But I do, I think one of the things I'm going to try to be very keen on as I, as my son, you know, grows into a young man is to really try and teach him how to be kind and generous to people, specifically when there aren't cameras around or when people aren't around. There's just such an unbelievable magic in this idea that every single person is fighting their own battles and all it takes is one unbelievable interaction with a stranger or someone, and that could be you or me, that can change the course of their day and have a ripple effect in their life. It really is that simple. I try to remind myself of that all the time because everything is about self-aggrandizement now. Like we're just so consumed with our own lives and everything we do, it just, it's, it's become, I think worse and worse, obviously with our addiction to our devices and things, but everyone going through the day, we're just, you know, we're worried about the next thing. We're worried about ourselves. And if you can occasionally just stop for a second, unplug from that and be present and genuine in an interaction with a stranger, whatever that might be, whether it's at like a grocery store or a clerk or someone like, oftentimes it's the people that that look the most miserable that need it the most. I try, I'm not great at it. You know, I'm just like anybody, like I'll be on my phone. I'm like, oh, thanks, see you later. But like, there is something like, there is something unusual these days. If you have a genuine interaction with somebody that you don't know and they're eye contact, they're kind, they seem genuinely interested in what you have to say, caring. It doesn't have to be aggressive, right? It can be in passing, but there's just something so special about that now because it seems to be almost like a lost art. And I wish there was more of that. And so much of what I watch on the internet is the exact opposite. It's people just being cruel and awful to each other and freaking out. And it's like, oh, uh, so part of my, uh, speaking of purpose, like part of my purpose is to kind of try and be the antimatter to, you know, everything that I watch online all the time, all this awful behavior is like, hey, I can't do anything to stop these people from acting crazy. And I'm going to watch these videos. I'm going to react to them because it's nuts. But, you know, I do have control of how I behave and how I treat other people. And I just think there's, you know, this is like, an, I think a bit of a, a cliche now, but you know, you can, I'm sure someone, I think there was someone who said that like a, 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 a famous person that said this once or something, but there's this idea that you can tell, you can really tell a lot about a person by how they treat someone that they're not obligated to treat nicely. Like how a rich, you know, how do you treat your server, right? How, how rich people treat wait staff, you know, if you, how do you treat people that you are, I guess, you can tell you can tell a lot about someone based on how they treat people they don't stand to gain anything from, right? If you're schmoozing and you're you're obviously gonna you're obviously gonna be nice and cordial to that person who's hosting the party or rich or whatever, like you know you wanna you want them to like you and be in their good graces because of status or whatever. But it truly is it's how you treat the people that you stand to gain absolutely nothing from. You treat that person with kindness and respect simply because they are another human being going through battles just like you are that's just true that's just a true testament to someone's character my earlier years in the restaurant i worked in a my early years at cheesecake factory i was working in a town that was a very ritzy part of the area i was living in so i was waiting on a lot of well-to-do guests that were very rich and there's such a there was such a crazy correlation and th this has never left like this has always stuck with me and, and kind of back to this you know back to this materialistic success and, and the purpose in life and like people that like are their only singular goal is to become rich. Like, man, I, in the five years I worked in this particular location that was, had a high concentration of high net worth individuals, there was a disproportionate amount of very miserable, unhappy people. And these are like, these are the people you would expect. You have the $3 million home. You drive in a $90,000 car. And you are a miserable prick or a miserable, 
miserable bitch. That's always stuck with me because this was at the time of my life when I was I was really grinding. I was doing the music thing. I was, you know, bartending lunch shifts and playing gigs at night and just really didn't have a pot to piss in. And I'm just like, man, I was like, imagine if I fucking, I said to my, I remember saying to myself, like, if I ever am lucky enough to be able to get out of this restaurant and like have a few bucks, like I will never forget this moment because if I ever turn into this type of person, it will all have been for nothing because I can't think of anything more miserable than being a derelict cocksucker and just a piece of shit to the people around you that you don't stand to gain anything from. And I've all, that's all that always resonated with me. And I still, so I think about that now, anytime I'm like, I'm being a fucking little bitch or I'm ungrateful or I'm, 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 you know, even borderline, like just getting fired, you know, getting fired up over something irrelevant and innocuous that just doesn't matter in the grand scheme of things. I'm like, man, what are you? I'm like, chill out. You got nothing to be, you got nothing to be nothing, but nothing but blessings. You got plenty to be thankful for. That is part of my North star and part of my motivation to continue doing what I'm doing. And the only thing I know is that I, I hope that no matter where my life takes me in the next three, five, 10 years, I can always continue to walk around with a level of empathy and, and just a general respect for the, my fellow human being. And I think that's just something that's really getting lost. And it's, it's easy to kind of be programmed by so much of the divisiveness and, and a lot of this polarizing hate that we see on the internet, whether it's not just internet. I mean, it's news networks, it's internet. It's, it's everything now. Everything's politicized. Everything's divisive and every, everybody hates each other. So it's, I think it's important to remember sometimes that we're all human. We all share the same characteristics. We all kind of want the same thing. We all want to be loved. We all want to love and be loved. We want to fit in. It's so funny. Like humans are so, so, so similar and alike in so many ways. And yet we manage to only focus on our differences. That's it. It's the only thing that gets any airtime is how different we are from each other. Why you suck and why I'm right and why you're wrong. That's like the only thing that we ever talk about ever publicly. It just makes me sad. But uh, I had this <sighs> this thing pop up earlier. I wanted to read it. It was it's stupid. But like I said, like as I'm trolling around on Twitter or X, I get these things. This is like the new the new Twitter. This must be like a content strategy for people trying to grow their like their lifestyle motivation brands or whatever. But it's like, this guy tweets, I'm 40. I've been broke, cheated on, and with no purpose. Here are 20 uncomfortable facts about money and life I wish you knew earlier. And anytime I see these things, I'm like, all right, I'll bite. So I'll click the thread and I'll read them. I haven't read through this one yet. So I just want to do it live. It, it just kind of feel like it could be some good conversation prompts. Um, first one is money is attracted to people who work. It's a silly, it's silly. Money's inanimate. I don't think it's attracted to anything. It's a fun way of saying if you work hard, you're more likely to make money, which I agree with. Marrying the right person is the greatest life hack, number two. I will also agree with that. But that's a little bit vague. Like, it's a little bit vague. I, I don't know. I do. I mean, listen, I agree with that. I, I think it just from, for me personally, like um, having uh, a partner and a wife that's, has just been so understanding all the way through. She's been uh, just kind of my journey and leaving the band and doing YouTube and doing online. It's been, it's been great. It really is. When you, when you, if you can, if you're lucky and fortunate enough to find somebody that you can share your life with that complements your weaknesses and vice versa, obviously there's going to be exceptions and there'll be difficulties and struggles like any relationship, but it can be awesome. I think it can really, I, just speaking for as a man, like I think a, a good man can become a great man with the right woman. I truly think that. Um, if you're easily offended, you have too much free time. <laughs> yeah, sure. I I think I'm, there's probably plenty of busy people that are easily offended too. I just think if you're easily offended, you're kind of a loser. Boasting about working 12 hour days isn't a mark of productivity. It's a sign of poor boundaries. I'll kind of agree about that. I do, you know, I've known people, we all know people that have made it their prerogative to, uh, or that they're, they've, they've made their propensity for working like a dog, their entire personality. And it's like, well, you know, and that's fine. Like, listen, I, I, like, again, like 
hard work. Hard work is good. Some people are doing it because they have to. They got to do it to survive. But it should be a means to an end. We got to figure out how to be more resourceful because it, ultimately it's a sign of poor boundaries. Yeah, I don't know. It is. It, <laughs> I knew, and I know other people too that do it because they just, they don't have the best home life. So they're like, they want to be at work because I don't want to be around the wife, the kids or whatever. It's, uh, yeah, I went through a phase where I was working quite a bit between the two jobs and trying to start an online business. I think it sometimes it's necessary, but it should be a means to an end. And, um, and it was, and I've, in the last couple of years, I've been in a phase where I've been fortunate enough to be able to uh, to enjoy some of the fruits of the spoils that were created over those years of really burning the candle at both ends. And I'm like, all right, maybe it's time to live life a little bit as well. And now a few things are a little more automated. So it's, yeah, create some boundaries. Marrying late is better than marrying wrong. Yeah, I mean, okay. I suppose. Uh, I, I mean, I would, I will definitely agree with that. I think anything not getting married or marrying late is, is just better than marrying and wrong in general, but that's such an easy thing to say. Like, I don't think many people are getting married being like, well, I'm marrying wrong, but I'd rather, I want to get married. Although I, sh I, I take that back. I know there are some people and some women that just really like, they get to a certain point and they would rather just be married to anyone than not married at all. And I think that's, that's probably a mistake. I also think there's a, there's definitely, I think even more common is people that have been in toxic relationships and they've gone through a lot of stuff and they, they know deep down that this is not a healthy relationship, but they think for some reason, if we just get married, that'll fix it. And then even worse than that, these same type of people after they get married and it isn't fixed and the relationship is still a disaster, they think, oh, if we just have kids, That'll fix it. Newsflash. Doesn't. <laughs> and now your kid's going to fucking deal with the side effects of your shit relationship, which sucks for them. Work ethic will outperform natural ability throughout a career. Yeah. Absolutely. There's You can be the most talented person in the world, but if you don't have work ethic, you can only get so far. Now, granted, like you look at people like the Michael Jordans and the Kobe Bryants, the, these are kind of like the, these are the good examples of people that had the natural ability and the work ethic, which they're just like, you know, the best at what they do, but, or they were just genetic, you know, destined to do what they did, had a propensity for it, but then became the best ever because their work ethic was unmatched, which I love that. But I know, I know lots of people. Or I mean, there's there's plenty of people out there that are much more successful than someone much more talented at what they're doing just because they have that work ethic. That's 100% accurate, I believe. Most people are too self-absorbed to understand what they want. Remember, this is something this guy, uh, it's 20 uncomfortable facts he wish he knew about life earlier. These all seem kind of like baity. Like, what does that even mean? Like, you're too self-absorbed to understand what they want. I guess kind of. And that kind of along with the lines of what I said earlier, where we're all, it's easy to get wrapped up in just the little day-to-day -day things, all our tiny little problems, our insignificant bullshit that can take up all our time because our fucking phone's pinging off the hook, notifications everywhere, emails. And it's like, you got to be able to shut down that noise sometimes and be intentional, make some goals, decide what you want, decide on a direction. What is my purpose? Ask yourself the tough questions and then make, you know, take, take actionable steps to, to start getting there. If, you know, because here, like, I guess to, along that point, you know, so many people are, have the same complaints year over year, over year, 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 over year, over year. And it's like, well, man, if you're still complaining about the same shit you were complaining about three years ago and you're still in the same spot and you haven't done anything to try and get out of that, then you have nothing to complain about because you're not even taking any any measurable action to try and change your situation. Happiness is a choice. Huh. Okay. Yes and no. I'll go, I'll go, I'll get, I'll do a yes and no on that. CEOs do more for this country than politicians and it's not even close. I mean, yeah, I, yeah, that's, that's, I think pretty much everyone does more for this country than politicians. <laughs> I'm being honest. Don't keep up with the Joneses. They're broke. Whatever that means. I guess that means like, yeah, don't try and, the people that work the hardest to keep up appearances are sometimes the ones that, yeah, I, I I agree with that one. I think that's the worst. I think I think money. I think money really the main goal 
for accumulating money is just time freedom, time freedom and relieving the stresses of just normal, normal basic needs. Acquiring money for the singular goal of trying to buy expensive things to appear a certain way, that's like low T behavior. That's like some pathetic shit. <sighs> Pathetic's maybe not the right word. Like it's okay to buy nice things and enjoy nice things, but we all know those people. It's oftentimes the people that try the hardest to appear a certain way. Real G's move in silence like lasagna, as Lil Wayne, as Lil Wayne used to say. Loud money don't make money. <laughs> the richest people in the world typically don't make it obvious that they're rich. One of the best ways to remain poor is to hate those who are rich and successful. Oh, okay. I'll agree with that. I think there is a general disdain by the public for rich people. I mean, I just, I think we see this a lot. This, this can get a little political in this case. You can get very political when you're talking about distribution of wealth. And I mean, there's obviously a lot of issues in this country uh, with, with wealth disparity. But I do think that if you are, unhappy with your situation economically, um, hating successful people and being mad that there's billionaires is going to do absolutely nothing to change your situation. So it's a waste of fucking effort. It's a waste of energy. It is your responsibility to be as fit, healthy, and financially secure as possible for your family. Yep. I agree with that. Absolutely. That's something that's definitely one of my core tenants as possible. So that is, that is what occupies a lot of my time is how I can I work on those things uh, daily. Those who complain the most accomplish the least. Totally agree. It's funny when I was working in the restaurant, you get to you get to know a lot of different personalities. I mean, the the restaurant working in a restaurant is one of those jobs which just attracts a whole, just an entire gamut of interesting people. And everyone knows that one server, or whoever it was, it just couldn't stop complaining about everything no matter what it was, just everything was a problem. And I'm like, man, is that, I, 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 I'm thinking of someone specifically right now that, that I used to work with and just feels like yesterday. It was probably fucking 15 years ago, but she like, I, I always felt so bad for her because like, I'm just like, is she, I don't, I think it's just who she is. I don't even know if she could change if she wanted to, maybe she could have, but I'm just like, her whole life is just dictated by er just complaining about everything. <laughs> I'm just like, uh, and yeah, that's you. The, the, the those who complain the most accomplish the least. Sure, your addiction to politics is dragging you down and making you an insufferable person to be around, whether you realize it or not. Ooh, spicy one. Tend to agree though. Tend to agree. I know I've spoken a little bit more about politics, like in the last podcast, and just generally how it's impacting my life and how it's it's tough to escape now because it's so prevalent incredible amount of cases where people have let their politics take take over their life and completely hijack their personality and it is insufferable it's okay to have certain ideologies and political leanings that um, inform how you live your life and you know maybe how you vote but you need to have substance beyond those things or it's just very unbecoming. Um, and I think this gets, has just been getting worse and worse. The more kind of polarizing politics have become, it's become so tribalistic, so tribalistic. And I'm just of the opinion that, you know, no politician is coming to save you. Like ultimately left, right, whatever the fuck you are, no, none of these suits Standing up there offering lip service, trying to say the things you want to hear. None of them give a singular fuck about you. And your only responsibility is to take care of yourself. Doesn't mean you can't vote and have opinions on things, but don't let it take over your life. My opinion. About 90% of money Twitter's advice will leave you poor and burned out. Sure. Arguing, arguing online is a sign of weakness. Eh, maybe, but sometimes it's fun. <laughs> just not too much of it. If you can sit for 60 minutes in total silence with no phone, no computer, and no distractions and be happy, then you're destined for greatness. This one's a little cheeky because like you're also a sociopath if you do that. <laughs> but uh, no, I agree. I mean, I've, I've talked about this before, but in today's age, like focus is a superpower. Like, well, people used to talk about not having enough time. It's like, it's not time that people don't have anymore. It's focus. People don't, people don't have the focus to get things done. 
So if you can figure out how to do that, you are destined for greatness. The secret to success is doing what other people are unwilling or not able to do. Yeah. Yeah, I'd say that's pretty milk toast obvious. And then as always, these threads, if you find this valuable, please retweet and follow, blah, 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 blah. I've just, I, these fucking threads come up all the time and some, some of them are pretty good. That one felt very kind of like surface level bullshit. I've seen some that are like pretty insightful though. Just talking about like little, little life nuggets, little life tidbits about things I wish I knew, things I would have, I'm 40 and these are the 30, 30 principles I would have told my 20 year old self. <laughs> Some of them are around fitness, some are around life in general. But So the punchline is um, that the older I get, the less I know. <laughs> I've said that before. And, you know, I know I spoke briefly about religion in the beginning. I didn't really get too much into it because I didn't, I just don't care to talk about it too much, but not afraid to make my particular stance known. And my particular stance is one of just a comfort I wouldn't say comfort's not the right word. It's a, it's an agreeableness and an acceptance of having no fucking clue what's going on. And I think there's almost, there's all, for me, there's almost a hubris amongst some people in their religious beliefs that they would proclaim that this and only this is the correct way to live your life. And there is no other alternative. If you don't agree with this, you are wrong or evil. And that's, I don't know. I just, I'm not a huge fan of that. I think faith and finding purpose through spirituality and a relationship with whatever God you want can be a wonderful thing. And I think there's often cases, regardless of whether or not I believe the objective truth behind it, I think it can be better than not for many people. I mean, there's a reason why a lot of recovering addicts or a lot of people that have gone through incredible trauma eventually or tend to find God to help them out of whatever place they were in because it's, you know, their old purpose being replaced with a new purpose. And I think that can be awesome. So I think there are so many situations where religion is the right move for me personally. Like, I guess part of being agnostic is like, I, I don't, I don't know that there's no, I don't know that there's no God just like, but at the same time, I, I can't sit here and tell you that there definitely is. Oh yeah. hundred percent has to be. Of course there is. Well, how could I, I don't know. I'm just too much. I'm just to, too much of a fucking hard headed. Like I need to feel it or touch it, you know, like, but that is the definition of faith, right? That is the, the definition of faith is unequivocally believing in something that you can't tangibly prove is real. <laughs> and, uh, yep. And that's life right there. And that's what it is. So I just want to leave you with this, like regardless of what you believe or don't believe once in a while, taking a moment to inventory why we're doing what we're doing can go a long way. What's the purpose? What are we doing it for? But I hope that we can kind of collectively land on some of the same principles of trying to put out some kindness to those around us, to be responsible, to show up for yourself, show up for your family, go the extra mile, do the right thing. But for me, I'm still figuring it out, man. So this is, this part of this has been just, uh, as well as just sharing with you guys, as I like to do on this, this podcast in a way that is very, very different than what I normally do. It's good for me to hear me say it out loud sometimes because Sometimes I have little epiphanies that I think about afterwards while I do these. So, um, yeah, I'm just going to keep, I'm just going to keep trying to figure out what makes sense for me and keep getting after it. And I hope you guys are doing the same. I know we're all working towards something, but, uh, I think at the end of the day that the one thing that sticks with me the most is oftentimes when you see these interviews with older people or they look back in their life and the greatest asset we have is time. So, no matter how much money you're trying to accumulate or how many material things you're trying to acquire to play with or look cool with. I think the important thing is to don't let any of that get in the way of watering the important relationships in your life. Cause really those are the things that matter. It's your relationship, friends, family, giving to those relationships pouring effort into those relationships, being generous, being kind with those relationships, because 
when you're 80 years old and you're old and decrepit, you're not going to care about that thing that costs money. You're not going to care about that cool car. It's going to be about who are those people in your life that you had an impact on and vice versa. And those are the things that matter. And it's easy to forget that in a world and a society that is so caught up in money and success and material and fame and all these things that are just vapor at the end of the day. So I hope you're doing great. And uh, I'm going to try and bring someone on next week and get a, get a little less prolific or esoteric and get back to, you know, maybe a little YouTube drama or something. We'll see what happens. But until then, I hope you have a wonderful week. Thank you guys so much for tuning in. As always, I hope you found any part of this uh, insightful or maybe it sparked a little something in your head that, uh, that can help inform uh, your week coming up. I appreciate it. We'll talk to you soon. Peace.